Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Vester Lee Flanagan? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you find this video enlightening, please like it and subscribe to my channel. In addition, consider supporting me on Patreon. Looking at a few of my recent pre-release videos on Patreon, we see enigmatic thumbnails like Playing the Hero, Mental Health Clinician of Death, and Obsessed with Marriage Killer. In addition, there are over 150 other videos available on my Patreon. My Patreon account can be found at www.patreon.com slash drgrande. The link is also available in the description for this video. Moving back to this case, first I'll look at the background of Vester Flanagan, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Vester Lee Flanagan was born in Oakland, California on October 8, 1973. Starting in high school and into his early 20s, Vester worked as a model. At the age of 14, he was featured in a Macy's fashion show. After graduating from high school, Vester went to San Francisco State University. In 1995, he earned a degree in radio and television. He worked as an assignment desk assistant at a CBS affiliate. Vester tried to break into acting, but did not have any success. He also worked as a male escort. Vester would later brag that he was a high-paid companion. Starting in 1997, Vester worked for a CBS affiliate in Savannah, Georgia. He was a general assignment news reporter. He left in March 1999 and went to work for an NBC affiliate, WTWC-TV, in Tallahassee, Florida. During his time there, he complained about his co-workers, and they complained about him. Vester said that his co-workers were making offensive remarks about his sexual orientation. His co-workers said that Vester was verbally abusive to them. He targeted two female employees on separate occasions after they advised him about mistakes in his reporting. Staff at the station did not want to work with Vester. They found him to be arrogant and condescending. In March of 2000, he was fired for odd behavior. He filed a lawsuit saying that the TV station discriminated against him based on his race. The lawsuit was settled in January 2001, but the terms were not disclosed. Over the next few years, Vester worked for Bank of America and Pacific Gas and Electric Company. In both positions, he was a customer service representative. After this, he returned to television news. From 2002 to 2004, Vester worked for a CBS affiliate, in Greenville, North Carolina. Vester took another break from the television news industry and worked as a communications director for a company in California. He was there for over seven years. On April 19, 2012, Vester was hired as a multimedia journalist at the CBS affiliate WDBJ in Roanoke, Virginia. He used the on-air name Bryce Williams. Not surprisingly, Vester became involved in disputes with other employees at the station, like reporters and photographers. Many employees felt uncomfortable around Vester. He was intimidating and threatening. In July of 2012, the station encouraged Vester to receive mental health care. It is not clear if he ever did. On February 1, 2013, the station fired Vester, saying that his behavior was volatile. After being notified about his termination, Vester yelled at station employees. They moved into a room to get away from him before the police escorted Vester out of the building. Earlier in the day, Vester had been involved in a confrontation with a videographer named Adam Ward. Adam may have recorded Vester when the police were escorting him off the property. The employees at the station were advised that if Vester ever returned to the building, they were to notify the police. Vester filed a complaint claiming racial discrimination. He specifically mentioned a general assignment news reporter named Allison Parker. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission conducted an investigation, but did not find any evidence to support Vester Flanagan's complaint. It was dismissed. Vester took a job at a large health insurance company, but he was still angry at WDBJ for allegedly discriminating against him. He posted messages on social media where he repeated his claims of discrimination. 
He specifically referenced the alleged behavior of Adam Ward and Allison Parker. Fester indicated he wasn't happy with Adam because Adam had filed a complaint against him. Fester was displeased with Allison because she allegedly made a racist remark about a friend of his. It wasn't an explicit remark, but rather it was a coded message. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On August 26, 2015, Allison Parker from WDBJ was conducting an interview at a shopping center near Smith Mountain Lake. This is about an hour southeast of Roanoke, Virginia. Allison was interviewing the executive director of the local Chamber of Commerce, named Vicki Gardner. Adam Ward was also there. He was operating the camera. Allison, Vicki, and Adam were standing just a few feet apart during the interview, which was being broadcast live. Allison was asking various questions, and Vicki was responding, nothing out of the ordinary. At about 6.46 a.m., Vester approached Allison, Vicki, and Adam. Vester was holding a 9mm semi-automatic pistol, specifically a Glock 19. He recorded himself on his phone as he stood near Allison, Adam, and Vicky. Vester pointed the pistol at Allison. The pistol was clearly visible in front of Vester. Vester was to Allison's right. She did not notice him pointing the gun at her. Vicky did not notice Vester. She would later say that the television lighting was so bright it interfered with her ability to see. Adam was facing away from Vester, therefore he did not notice him either. About five seconds after pointing the weapon, Vester lowered it. Right before he did this, he called Allison an inappropriate name. It rhymes with the word witch. About 18 seconds later, he once again pointed the gun at Allison. This time, he attacked. Vester discharged the pistol 15 times. Allison was struck in the head and chest. She did not survive. Adam was also killed after being struck in the head and torso. Vicky was shot in the back. She was seriously wounded, but she did survive. Vester fled the scene in his Ford Mustang. Employees of WDBJ reviewed the video from Adam's camera. A man holding a gun can be seen in one frame. The employees said the shooter looked like Vester Flanagan. At 8.23 a.m., Vester removed all doubt when he sent a 23-page fax to ABC News. It was a bizarre and rambling series of complaints about being a victim. At 10 a.m., Vester called ABC News and confessed to the murders. In addition to implicating himself in the double homicide, Vester was trying to get away. He drove to Roanoke Blacksburg Regional Airport and rented a Chevrolet Sonic. He then drove north on Interstate 81 and east on Interstate 66. The license plate of the rental car was captured by an automated license plate reader installed in a Virginia State Trooper's vehicle. The trooper requested backup and attempted to pull Vester over, but Vester kept driving. He did not even make it two miles before driving off the road and striking an embankment. Vester Flanagan used his weapon on himself. He was airlifted to a hospital and pronounced dead at 1.26 p.m. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, Vester was involved in a lot of conflict with various people throughout his career. He was routinely described as rude, arrogant, and condescending. Vester would often berate people for making any type of criticism about him. He would lose his temper even if the remark was innocuous. For example, at the health insurance company where he worked, a woman told him that he was being quiet. He told her never to talk to him again. Vester didn't get along with his neighbors either. One time when he lived in an apartment complex, he threw cat feces at his neighbor's home after a dispute. There's no doubt that Vester was creative. Where most people would see a litter box, Vester saw an ammunition source. Item number two, Vester claimed that he was pushed over the edge by Dylan Roof. Dylan Roof was a killer who murdered nine black people attending a Bible study in South Carolina in 2015. Vester believed that the best way to get revenge was to conduct a shooting of his own. 
He admired the Columbine High School shooters, as well as the Virginia Tech shooter. Mester was especially fascinated with the number of people those shooters killed. It is reasonable to believe that if Fester had escaped the police, he would have killed again. Inside of the Chevrolet Sonic that Vester rented, the police found his pistol, several magazines, a to-do list, disguises, a cell phone, and three license plates. He may have been trying to avoid detection so that he could kill again. Item number three, Vester had some early successes in the area of people admiring him which may have positively affected his self-esteem, perhaps giving him an inflated sense of his level of attractiveness. I mentioned how Vester was a model. He was also voted homecoming prince during his junior year of high school. I've heard of homecoming kings and queens, but homecoming prince sounds like they're just taking the whole idea to an extreme. Pretty soon we will see a homecoming duke, marquess, earl, viscount, and baron, after that, there will be a homecoming valet, butler, and footman. Esther's appointment as homecoming prince probably did not help with his narcissism. One thing is for certain, being a prince doesn't make a person immune from playing the victim. Sometimes a prince will find someone to marry who amplifies their ability to play the victim. Item number four, how would I conceptualize this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Esther was quick to take offense hypersensitive to criticism, distrustful, resentful, he held a grudge, he was pessimistic, and insecure. In addition, he was antagonistic, self-centered, and had a tremendous sense of entitlement. All these characteristics align with vulnerable narcissism. Vester thought very highly of himself. He believed himself to be extremely attractive. When Vester entered the world of television news, he ran into a lot of competition. He was unable to stand out and advance his career. This activated his vulnerable narcissism. He could not accept that he wasn't special. Therefore, he sought another reason for his failure. He was looking for an alternate explanation. Esther came up with this idea that he was being discriminated against based on his race and sexual orientation. There's no evidence that this was true, but the truth was not important to Vester. For him, the priority was protecting his ego. Every time he became antagonistic, he only made his career situation worse. It was a vicious cycle of being offended, acting out, then dealing with the consequences. Those consequences offended him, and the cycle started over. As far as Vester's claims about getting revenge for the murders committed by Dylan Roof, I don't think that's why he did it at all. I think Vester was looking for a reason to kill that did not make him look like he was being petty and arrogant. He was trying to disguise his own failure and die as a hero. Claiming to avenge other murders was Vester's last chance to be perceived positively. Like most of Vester's behavior, this was also a failure. Item number five. From the video of the shooting that Vester recorded, it seems amazing that Allison did not see him pointing the gun at her. Many people find this to be unusual. It would not have necessarily changed the outcome if Allison did see him, but how could she have missed that? I think the main reason for Allison missing Vester was that she was highly focused on doing her job. This was a live broadcast, therefore it required her full attention. Also, she had no reason to expect that a person would point a gun at her during a live broadcast. Typically, criminals do not like to be featured on television. One could argue that conducting an interview that's being broadcast live is one of the safest activities a person could do. I think the situation with Allison not recognizing the threat can be thought of as a metaphor for Vester's vulnerable narcissism. Grandiose and vulnerable narcissists are both dangerous, but vulnerable narcissists tend to let the pressure build over time and act out in some extremely dangerous way. Vester even acknowledged this when he wrote that he was a human powder keg just waiting to go boom. Vulnerable narcissists are insidious. They hide in plain sight. Just like Allison did not recognize Vester as a threat when he was standing right next to her, many people do not fully understand how dangerous a vulnerable narcissist 
can be. I think the lesson learned in this case is about situational awareness. It's critical to recognize the dangers of narcissists who are resentful, vengeful, insecure, easily offended, and always the victim. Those are my thoughts in the case of Vester Flanagan. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be as intriguing as a homecoming Viscount and Viscountess. Thanks for watching. On a side note, this particular video will be the last video that I'll record in this studio. I am moving to another house, and the studio is being dismantled and partially reassembled somewhere else. I'm having some new material put together for the background, so the background won't be the same. So I do have to say goodbye to the brick wall behind me, which has served me well for quite some time. So the videos, of course, will continue. I'll keep working to make videos, but I will have to go through a process of reconfiguring a new studio. I don't predict any service interruptions or anything like that. The order I record videos is not always the order I release them. But again, this is the last video which was recorded in this particular studio, which I call Studio 3. I look forward to building Studio 4. I'll talk to you soon.